along the lines of the topic that we're trying to work on here. And so, great, that makes my job easier for because uh, you guys already kind of know what it's about. So the area that I work on is called uh, informative touch for soft robot. And what that means is right now if you look at a lot of um, robots in a factory, for example, they're supposed to be, uh, many of them are supposed to be for collaborative, alongside, working alongside humans. But they're really not, right? A lot of times they're boxed off in areas where people aren't supposed to go in because you might get injured. And if, you want, if the robot did a good job and you wanted to give it a pat on the back, for example, it wouldn't have any idea what you're doing. And so there's, in terms of making robots that are more collaborative, so like assistive and service robots in the future, there's a lot of, uh, touch plays a very important role. And so a little bit about our lab and school as a whole. So the Contextual Robot, Robotics Institute at UCSD is fairly new, started in 2015, but since then it's grown really quickly. I didn't expect it to uh, grow so big in size so quickly. But um, that makes it really exciting because there's so much room for interdisciplinary collaboration. And so it's a very exciting time to be here in the San Diego community as a whole. Yeah. And so biologically inspired robotics, uh, this is some of the work that my advisor uh, started during his postdoc, and so the, the main pillars of the research in our lab are autonomous soft systems, functionally graded materials, and self-assembly like holding. And so the top images are what you might see in nature, and the bottom images are what some of the uh, biomimicry that we can build today. And I'll mostly be focusing on the, uh, the leftmost column because that's the area that I'm further developing, but I'm happy to talk more about the other sections if you guys have any questions. And as always, feel free to interrupt at any time too. Any questions or comments? You know Todd Hilton? Yeah, he's, um, him and Henrik are doing a fantastic job with like, growing the institute. video doesn't seem to work, but I'll just give you a brief description. So this is like a, a clip from a car factory, uh, or what you would see in a car factory at an exhibition. And basically it goes back to what I was saying before, which is all these moving parts, they're not really safe for humans to be around, even though a lot of times you do see humans in factories trying to help out at different points along the assembly line. And the, the reason we can afford to do put robots in an environment like this is because it's a very well understood structured environment. And as soon as you get outside of those constraints, then that's when you need some sort of robustness or uh, compliance to uncertainty because otherwise there's a lot of room for um, errors to, for example, cause failures in your control system. So another example of that um, is the DARPA Robotics Challenge, the humanoid one from just a couple years ago. The simulation environments and the testing that everyone did was assuming that the floors were rigid, but what they didn't tell the competitors was that during the actual competition, they were gonna swap out the rigid ground for sand. And so that's why if you look up any of the highlight videos for the DARPA Robotics Challenge uh, back in 2015, the, it's just a bunch of million dollar robots just falling over. and Again, the reason for that is because they were tested and programmed in an environment that's very well understood and constrained, but as soon as you get into like search and rescue in a collapsed building or uh, terrain that's uneven, then you introduce a lot of noise to your system, and that's when we might need soft robotics. I hope this works. This one's really cool. Similar, uh, yeah, the octopus is really amazing. This is the one where it, the only rigid part of an octopus is its beak. And so it can conform and change its shape and squeeze through really tight spaces. It's really only constrained by its mouth piece. 
And so like even if brains, intestines, everything inside it could just kind of squish it and compress itself down however it wants. And so a lot of the work in our field is really looking at what you might find in biology and nature and trying to think about how do we engineer some of these same properties. Yeah? Would you consider Baymax a form of uh, soft robotics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a picture of that later, so definitely. So the run is soft and hard, this is kind of the tagline that uh, you'll find a lot of times in the current research because what you give up in soft robotics is you don't have very precise kinematics, you don't necessarily have great sensors because a lot of times the sensors that you need have to now be as flexible as the material that you're embedding them within. And so it's very much a growing field and people are still trying to figure out how to, what's like, what kind of algorithms do you need to control these systems? What, um, what sensors can we develop? And also just how do you make actuators that fit into, that, that perform well? And how do you get to something like human muscle, which is amazing from like an energy density and like a size standpoint. And so if you look at biological versus engineering, this is a really interesting spectrum showing that a lot of times the materials that we currently use to build anything, not just robots, but just engineering materials in general, they're typically on the right side of the spectrum of Young's modulus, meaning like relating to the stiffness of the material. But in contrast, if you look at a lot of the materials that you might find in nature or yourself, it's a lot more on the softer, flexible side. And so things like cartilage, tissue, those are all much softer than like metal, like steel and aluminum. Okay. One point about this is that the materials found in biological organism, we do have, a lot of times, um, if you look at sea creatures, they don't necessarily have internal rigid structures because they're not constantly in competition with gravity, but if you look at Again, ourselves or anything, any animal that lives on land, most of them have uh, internal skeletons to kind of keep yourself up. Otherwise, it'd be hard to maintain stability. And so now we're kind of getting a little bit more into the details of um, what we're doing in our lab, which uh, in this area, I'm gonna talk a little bit about soft robotic manipulation and tactile sensing because uh, as we talked a little bit about earlier, touch is a, plays a very important role in um, communication and sensing and interaction with your environment. And so what you see here is a couple different types of soft actuators. Most of these are pneumatic related or use some sort of air or fluid. And so the ones here, they're a little blurry, but these are like pneumatic actuators, so you can think of it as a balloon. And actually, I brought some, so we can pass them around. But the pneumatic actuator does what's in like these, this one, this one, and actually most of these. The only one that's significantly different in, uh, in function is the jamming gripper up here which if you think of it as a bag of coffee grounds, when you conform that to a surface, it'll kind of take its shape. But if you just pull that off, then it'll go back to its original shape. But the phenomenon that some people observe, which is really cool, is uh, now if you place it on an object and it takes its shape and you pull a vacuum, the, mater the granular material inside, like the coffee grounds, will actually stick together and hold its shape. And so using that, they're able to pick up pretty fragile objects like the beaker. And so I'll start by passing this around. This has a little bit of the sensing involved as well. 
but um, you can just kind of get a sense of like the types of materials that we're working with. Similarly, a lot of people are looking at mobile soft robots. So, uh, in particular, how do you make and imitate what you see outside every day? So there's like fish, a lot of worms, stuff that jumps. So there's a lot of challenges and opportunities for soft robotics right now, uh, including untethered soft robots. How do you combine soft and rigid components? How do you integrate sensing or make sensors that you can wear? And then swimming and folding. And so what I'm going to focus on today is sensing the sensing skins and wearables. And I think. Another lab mate of mine, Caleb Christensen, he's going to be giving another talk in like a month or so, but he's going to focus on swimming and dielectric elastomers, which is another type of artificial muscle. And so to get a sense of the types of motion, because so far I've only showed you um, pictures, but how do they, what kind of motion do they have? So. The actuator that you see here, this is similar to the one that's being passed around. It has three chambers. It's basically like a fancy sort of glorified balloon. And uh, when you inflate the different chambers, that'll cause the, the actuator to bend. And so that's kind of. What you see in that one is uh, the same geometry as this. This one has some sensing embedded. But for example, if I were to inflate this chamber, then it would bend like that because this one, the bellows along this axis would expand. And so you can actually, uh, you can actually try it out. So one thing to note about a lot of the actuators that our lab is developing specifically is that many of them are pneumatics based, meaning they require some sort of air source. And a lot of times what you don't see is kind of hidden off to the side in many of the videos or pictures. And one aspect of the research that we're doing is looking at how can you make it more compact. But as a demonstration, it's uh, the motion is kind of like that. <laughs> Try another one. Is there an advantage to air over like, fluids I mean, for the type of actuation? You know? That's a great question. I think um, right now we use air because it's convenient, but we do have some work on looking at, again, going back to the swimming robots. So in that case, we can use fluids. And so actually this system that's on the left here, this is just kind of control the positive and negative pressures that go into the system. And you can actually use uh, fluid with this system. So it's waterproof as well. But like what difference does that make? So if you use air, what do you get that you don't get water? If you use water, what goes wrong? What's the positive, what's the advantages and disadvantages? Mm -hmm. So um, air is incompressible, meaning that, um, or water. Is water yeah, sorry, water is incompressible. And so when you have, um, when you have, when you fill your system with fluid, the, there's less kind of like a load up time for when the, so if you, if you um, it's a little hard to tell just from observing this, but if I'm to press this and then, or pull, it, pull the air back, there's kind of, um, the, the air inside has to fill the container first and then before it moves, but for fluids, you don't have as much of a delay there. So, it's a pretty marginal difference, but that's a great point because that it does impact the programming control system. Does it also take more energy to move since water is uh, a little heavier? 
Yeah, that's true as well. What are these wires here for? Is the haptic sensor feedback you and is it used for? Yeah, exactly. So I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. But, um, but what he's pointing out here is that there are some black traces along this actuator, and those are the sensors that uh, I'll be talking about in a little bit. Okay. Another cool thing you can do with this material, and actually I'll, I'll just pass this one around without the screen for now, because um, the one that's going around right now, that's made from a material called silicone, and the one we have here is 3D printed using a multi-material photopolymer. And so it's a, the end result and what you do with it is similar, but the material itself is a little different. And the cool thing about the polymer-based one is that you can directly embed sensors into the material by using a conductive ink. One cool thing about the bellows is that you can get what it's not really self-healing material-wise, but you can have functionality even after cutting it because when you use a vacuum, the material kind of scrunches on itself as opposed to when you inflate it and the air would just leak out. So in this video, um, the person cut the actuator and then just showing that it can still work. self-healing is in close is because um, there are people who are actually working on the chemistry side of making the material bond back together when it's cut. Um, We're kind of cheating in the sense that this self-healing is more just uh, geometric and due to the, um, the property of like the structure because when you pull the vacuum, the, um, the air is being sucked out, yeah, but it seals itself. So if you cut one of the bellows, it wouldn't work. Like it would be a gigantic leak in there, right? If you cut one of the ridges there. Like cut it like this slice? Cut, cut it with scissors. Yeah, yeah, probably not. Okay. So here it's like a small slit. Okay. If you kind of have small um, <coughs> small deformations, then it'll be taken out of work. Yeah, it. but it's, it's, this is more limited than the people who are actually working on self-healing. But I think the, the concept that to take away here is that um, you can kind of use these materials to build towards how you know your your body just uh, seals itself up. Um, oh, it's very amazing process almost, and what we can do in terms of materials is uh, very basic compared to what you see in biology. Okay. So, <coughs> So um, uh, you, you brought up Baymax earlier, and so I think this is exactly uh, the sort of concept pills that... Pills very dope boy. What's that? Is that the pills very dope boy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's about the same. In, <laughs> but uh, this, this one's actually from Big Hero 6, which is a uh, great movie. It's uh, how, like, well, it's how robotics is... Um, a student in the future, and then they're trying to... Speaking of medical robotics. Yeah, yeah. I'm not summarizing it very well, but you should definitely watch it. It's a really good movie. Yeah. yeah. What's it called? Beto? Big Hero, Hero 6. Six. It's a Pixar movie. Yeah, dude. I think there's actually a research going on with this at CMU. There's a professor who's doing, like, actually making BMAX in real life. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What, what Baymax represents here is he's basically also just like a big balloon robot and he's uh, very safe to interact with. So like the kid in the movie, you see him like hugging it and they're like, the, I think the Baymax saves him at one point by like sliding under while he's falling or something like that. Until he puts on his armor. Yeah, yeah that's true. Then that's he's pretty dangerous. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so Baymax is great inspiration for a lot of the stuff that we're working on. But again, going back to um, some of the robots 
pictures that we looked at earlier, a lot of them don't have sensing, and so they wouldn't really be able to understand what, you know, he's poking himself in the stomach, but if you do that to a robot right now, they're, they don't even know you're there, basically. And so, I'm gonna be switching back in and out for the videos, but we're basically doing similar stuff here, which is, um, using the actuator that we passed around and inflating them, depending on the pattern that you input, you can get it to do a lot of interesting action. And so the thing we observed about the kind of three chamber actuator is that it gives you a great range of motion compared to like two or one chambers. But, um, and what you can do with it is you can manipulate a lot of different types of objects. So of course there are definitely limitations to the workspace that's involved here. But um, what we wanted to demonstrate here was that you can work with both rigid, fragile, soft materials, and thin, thick, and so on. And just this is kind of like a first step towards some of the grippers that we're working on now. And as someone pointed out earlier in the bottom left, that's with the sort of like a sensor skin, we call it. And you can pattern that in however sh uh, shape or design you want. It starts off in 2D, um, something like this. And so we go through a masking process with non-conductive and conductive materials, and then that's how we end up with this um, skin, basically. And then we can wrap that around the object that, we're, that, uh, that you want to put it on. So how does it work? Do you just get any time that there's any kind of um, connection between the two, but do you, what do you get out of this sensor? Do you get a voltage? Do you get, what do you get? So, yeah, exactly. So, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Resistance. You get resistance. So a voltage drop. Yeah, you set up with the electronics to read a voltage drop, but the, the material itself, we're looking at changes in resistance. Okay. There's, there's also, uh, we've been experimenting with capacitive and inductive ones as well. So you can kind of, um, choose what mode you want to measure it in, depending on the geometry of the sensor and what material you're making it with and uh, many other parameters. So you would design it in such a way that if, let's say, I touch anywhere along those double bars, let's just say, that's in the middle, uh, bottom left there, mm -hmm. um, it would know how far up or how far down I've touched? No, so not for this one. This one, the bar ones, the long ways, yeah. Others. Those are just for looking at the deformation of the chambers. So we have a like a very uh, simple analytical model, detailing, kind of looking at the solid mechanics, and using that to get a estimate of where the uh, actuator is in space. Okay. And then the one in the um, so one over here. This one acts as like a fingertip. So this is one of uh, our uh, older versions. So. Uh, the concept you mentioned of knowing where you're touching it along that uh, entire body, yeah. that's something that we're actually working on now. Okay. But uh, it's still in progress. But this is a more basic version <coughs> of that concept. Okay. So the moment you touch it, it gives you a, resi a voltage drop and you know there's a touch there and that's it. Like exactly. Okay. But the reason why... so. You might be thinking, well, a lot of off-the-shelf sensors are capable of this as well, but the reason why we need <coughs> soft materials for the sensor skin as well in this situation is because, going back to that video, there's a lot of um, complex rotational and out-of-plane bending motion, and we needed something that can um, also uh, account for those changes. And so that's why we had to develop our own sensor technology. Can it feel how much pressure is being pressed on it? It's not a direct measurement of the uh, pressure or force, but we have a mapping of like how much change in resistance corresponds to the force. Ah, okay. Yeah. Does the resistance change with the amount of uh, deformation, the bending, or how does it work? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this is the one in question, basically. So. For example, if uh, imagine this one inflating, so it'll bend like this, and this sensor, the uh, the long ways one, yeah. will kind of stretch out, and that will uh, correspond to 
how much the actuator is bending like in one direction or another. And then what we're doing with the fingertip is coming into con when it comes into contact, that's how you identify like, oh, I'm holding an object or something. And so this works because the way this works is this is kind of like a, it looks like a strain gauge. And basically when something comes into contact here, the this these traces deform inwards here, and so then you get it. So what type of material is that that the resistance changes with deformation? So this the material that we made, uh, or the material that we made these with is called uh, CPMS, and what that stands for is a it's a type of silicone mixed with carbon nanotubes, and so um, it's able to it's a conductive material, but it's also stretchy because of the silicone, mm -hmm. and so you can. Uh, measure it and get a resistance value. Where do you get stuff like that? Uh, <laughs> you can get it off like um, CPMS, you say? Yeah. yeah. So you, some carbon nanotubes are available online, and then you just mix it with silicone and yeah, exactly. squirt it out in whatever pattern you want. Most of the, I think one cool thing about soft robotics as a field, a lot of the stuff you see here that we're showing is the material is re very readily available to the point where like uh, even the, the high school I went to, they, um, I had gone back to visit, and then they decided to do like a small kind of workshop using these materials, because you can just get them online. Yeah, you, you can literally go down to the hardware store and buy 100% RGB silicon caulk, and then ground up uh, pencil leads to, for the graphite. And I mean, I've done that, and it doesn't work tremendously well, but it'll work. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, I think the nice thing is the barrier to entry is very low. So. Mm -hmm more about how can you, um, well, it's, it's very easy to build these, but how do you do something with it is where it gets complicated. Sorry, I'm not seeing it. CPMS, what, sensor or? Uh, CPDMS. CPDMS. Yeah. CPDMS. Sensor? So PDMS is a type of silicone, and then C is for the nanotube. OK, capacitive. What can be used for capacitive? Yeah, yeah, you can use it. OK, but yep. that's the one. OK, cool, yep. thank you. Yeah, I think we kind of covered a lot of the details in the next couple slides, but uh, let's see if I missed anything. Yeah, uh, this is going back to earlier, so yeah, the, the role of touch in our everyday interaction can't be understated. It's even though most of our communi a lot of our communication is vocal and uh, vision based, but there's a lot of sub subtle nuances through touch. And so two examples, one is screwing in a light bulb. So that's kind of where the twisting comes into play because that requires such dexterous motion. So your, your finger joints are very, very complicated. Uh, they're able to do like very amazing motions that you wouldn't really see with, uh, with robot arms these days. And so um, the typical robot screwing in a light bulb would look something like this. So it's mostly like just a rotational joint at the wrist. And uh, much more straightforward from a mechanical standpoint. There have been some more advanced uh, robot hands that are kind of also trying to mimic this screwing in a light bulb process. Uh, and what you actually might observe here is that these muscles, these artificial muscles here, they're also pneumatic based. They're called um, Kibben muscles, which is basically also a balloon in a mesh, and when you inflate the balloon, it'll cause the mesh to kind of contract. It's kind of like the Chinese finger traps, have you guys played with those before? Uh, same sort of motion, but actuated. And using that, you're able to get these contraction behavior. But I thought this was probably the closest thing I've seen to a robot turned, screwing in a light bulb the way you might see it. Another place where this might be useful is uh, for physical human robot interaction, specifically in the classroom. So one of the projects at UCSD is called the Ruby Project, and it's this robot on the left here. The, the one over here is the older version, but this one has a touch screen face, there's another screen on its stomach, and then it has two, like kind of like a parallel jog gripper. And it's actually quite amazing how engaged 
kid, this is for um, kids around the age like three to five, and it's for observing their the social dynamics and interactions in a classroom setting. And they've had this robot just like sit in a classroom for thirty days and just kind of observe like who who's this more social group and like who's um, not social and like kind of kind of identifying the, their spying behavior. on children. Exactly, but for <laughs> cognitive, <laughs> in the hopes of improving cognitive development, so it's for, it's good. Um, but one thing that they come to us about is, right now all of that material is made from rigid materials, or all that robots made from rigid materials, and so, for example, it has, the purpose of the grippers is to hold up toys and the kid can like hand the robot uh, different stuffed animals, but a lot of times it just drops them because it can't really handle the variations in sizes and shapes. And so we're looking at giving this robot skin and improving the grasping capabilities. And so one challenge that's come up in, in developing the sensors is how do you integrate the sensing? And so the, what you see here is a couple of different types. The one on the right is a robot that uses kind of like, a, almost like a fiber opti optic cable. So in the fingers, it has a kind of like a tube that runs along it. There's an LED on one side and an infrared receiver on the other. And depending on how much that tube vents, that affects how much light the receiver uh, picks up. And then they use that to estimate Functionally, it's kind of similar to the resistive ones that I was showing you. Just more precise? It's arguably so in, in some instances because um, the, so they can pick up pretty uh, relatively high frequency behavior. And I would say the advantage of this process is that uh, compared to the silicone materials, like the ones we're working on, there's less hysteresis and drift. So less, um, it's less impacted by time because the polymers, when you stretch a polymer out, it kind of takes a little bit for it to realign. Here, light doesn't have as much of an issue with that, but the trade-off there is that light these light sensors require much more electronics and mm -hmm. it's a lot bulkier. So what you don't see is off the board, they have a lot of peripheral electronics. Mm -hmm. But so sensing is, uh, integrating sensing is very much like an open problem in our field right now. And so, before I dive more into the one that we passed around, talk a little bit about the 3D printed sensors, which is that second one that we've been talking about. Uh, with that multi-material printer, we realized that you can use some of the, um, the ones with conductive ink to develop sensors of like any shape that you want. And so right now, the, uh, the one that you see here, it's basically this one, and so it has one kind of like a brain-shaped thing and a heart-shaped thing. Sensor-wise, it's not super interesting. It's, this is more demonstrating that the 3D capability that you could make with this process. But this one is more interesting from a sensor perspective. We kind of call it 2.5D because what it is is it's a bunch of, it's like a serpentine pattern going in this axis, a serpentine pattern going in this axis and then a circle in kind of like the Z axis. So you, it's, it comes out as a flat sheet, but if you, depending on how you stretch it or press it, you can use it as a strain and a force sensor. And then the one in the bottom right, this is just for characterization purposes, this is kind of for elongation. And the cool thing about this is that right now, what I talked about for the ones in the picture, those are for if you measure this material as a resistor, but if you measure it as a capacitor and kind of change up the geometry, you can you can also use it for things like proximity. And so right now, this is the one that you guys were holding. The trace that is being measured is the one on this face, and this is a grounded copper plate to form basically a capacitor and the plate itself, and you can see that the reading is, the signal-to-noise ratio on the reading is pretty good. 
But it's copper plate, right? Like if you had a wall, drywall or something, yeah, it wouldn't sense. Would it? Yeah, no, it, it wouldn't. So okay. this is specifically for demonstrating the um, like if you were to use it as a capacitor with external ob external okay. objects that have an electric field. And it works good for sensing. And so, this is the mapping you were talking about? Almost. So this is leading up to it. This one is uh, not what, this is another project from a different university, but what they were doing was they had off-the-shelf sensors, so their fingers only go one way, and they're using that to grab a lot of these different objects, and depending on the space, uh, when I say space, I mean like the uh, different readings, so each axis represents one of the three sensors in each of those fingers, you can use that to classify the different objects that you're holding. So most, uh, most objects, their argument is that you'll get a unique signature in the sense that if you pick up, for example, like um, this syringe, my fingers are oriented in a certain way, and there's not so much um, variance in how I hold it when it's like this, and so all of those signals will kind of bunch up somewhere in this 3D or however many dimensional space. And so the argument that they're making here is you can learn these different object graphs from a purely uh, machine learning perspective. And I think if you think to you know how you grow up and how you learn what object different objects are and what they look like, of course we have much many more sensory inputs, like we have vision, sound, taste, touch, so on. But a lot of times we, you know, especially when you're young, you can imagine, you see like babies just grasping at all sorts of different objects, kind of getting a sense of like texture, rigidity, stiffness, so on. And I think the validity of the learning-based approach is that it's true to some extent, not fully. So the approach that we're taking is kind of a hybrid between a physics-based approach and a learning-based approach. But in, in here, this project, they were showing that you can learn quite a lot just from a purely learning-based perspective. And so one, I think one case where it would be, um, or just like one counterexample to this method would be imagine if I'm holding this, versus like this, right? You'll get totally different readings, even though it's the same object. And so there's a little bit more to just looking at your sensor readings when trying to classify objects. And so by no means do uh, I have a solution for this problem for very difficult thing, but the question is kind of how much intuition do we have about the shapes of an ob shapes of an object versus just the sensor readings from our muscles and tendons and kind of where do you draw the threshold or place the slider bar between the two sides of the spectrum and I think that's more of just a general guiding question to think about Love the picture yeah yeah that's great cool. And so a little bit more details about this project, which was we're looking at not just the twisting and rotating capabilities of the finger, but also how can you use that to map an object. So imagine I ask you to close your eyes and reach into your pockets and pick up an object and tell me what it is. A lot of times you would go through a similar process, right? Like I would, for example, like my phone, I might like kind of figure out the outline of the edges and more parameters that these sensors don't necessarily pick up, but the sensor or the general idea is like just trying to figure out what the shape looks like from a tactile perspective. And so what we're doing with the information that we can collect from these sensors is to generate a point cloud of an object. Uh, even though I'm recording it with the camera, there's no camera involved in the actual process. Or there's no computer. <laughs> and 
And so, again, we've covered most of the details of this, the actuator development, sensor development, analytical model, and then the results of the tactile object modeling. And this is kind of what I was talking about, which is same video as the one earlier, so skip that for now. But um, this is kind of like the off-board electronics that we've been using. Uh, the board is much bigger than necessary. It's very modular because we're making changes on the go. So what I mean by that is if you really wanted to compact everything, it could be much smaller. But at the same time, it is important to keep in mind that you do need a lot of electronics and pneumatics for a metric like this. So there's definitely some trade-offs. The material here, the way, the way we make it is um, this is a side view of that plate that I passed around earlier. And it's two different types of silicone. So one is called dragon skin, and that's the one on the outer layer. And then the CPMS uh, in here, that goes on the inside, and you attach a wire to it. And then uh, to get a pattern, we use, uh, we laser cut these masks from masking tape, and then spread the CPMS across it. And so that's how you can get shapes of, or you can customize the shape very easily. Do you have to use multiple layers of the tape, or is it one enough? Or? Yeah, one one is enough. But I guess it you know depends on the thickness of oh. what you're using. Yeah. Do you have to pass voltage? For like, at what voltage does it run in order for you to get? Well, is it like five volts? Three, I'm just curious. Is it a high voltage, low voltage? Does it matter? So the nice thing about this material specifically is that, the, for example, if I connect a multimeter to this, the reading around 10 kilo ohms for on average. And so, uh, of course, that depends on you know how much how much percentage of nanotubes you put into your mix or how thick you make the layers. But the magnitude is in the range of your carbon packed resistors. On the other hand, the 3D printed sensors that I showed you before, we actually need uh, more specialized electronics that are more sensitive because those are in the mega ohm range. And so it's much higher resistance. So it really depends on, um, yeah, your materials can impact the readings a lot. But for something like this, we can use it, run it off something like Arduino. There's some sensors in the brain that determine what those different sensors Yeah, definitely. There. Yeah, you need some sort of computer system with it as well. Is there a lot of ambiguity between what you get out of those sensors? Meaning, if I press on in the middle of it versus the end of it, will it be able to sort of sense it, mm -hmm. sense where it is, or is it just anywhere along there? If you apply the same amount of pressure, you're going to get the same amount of voltage drop or resistance change or whatever. That's a great question because in this in what we're presenting here, the answer is no. You wouldn't be able to tell a difference. If, let's say you're pressing it the same amount. You wouldn't be able to tell a difference between pressing it here versus here, okay. approximately. The, it'll, both uh, locations will change the reading, and you wouldn't be able to tell just from a single sensor like that where you're contacting it. But the, some of the learning projects that we're working on now look at the redundancy. So thinking about the sensors in our skin, we have a very dense distributed network all along our bodies, right? And so part of the reason for this is because if we just had a single sensor like that in our arm, we also wouldn't be able to tell. So part of that redundancy and distributed network is what allows you to distinguish between here versus here, for example. And so we have actuators and sensors where we've packed multiple sensors into a single actuator, and we're looking at how do you those readings to figure out where along the actuator are you contacting it. But that's a great question because I think that's very much like uh, a limitation of this this approach here. Well, you had another slide where you had the um, the multiple layers, and they were on top of each other, or were they layers that were just smushed on a very thin sort of tape? Do you remember the one that you had? The, the printed one? Uh, the serpentine and the circular. Yeah, that one. So
So is this the type of redundancy you're talking about? Similar. So here, if I were to, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. If I were to press it here, like top right versus bottom left, yeah, you still wouldn't be able to tell. Uh -huh. You need, um, you would need more like different circle sizes, for example, to say like. Um, so the overlapping pattern wouldn't give you a signal that says this part of the circle, this part of this horizontal going serpentine, and this part of the vertical serpentine wouldn't give you a location? No, no you need a grid as opposed to a serpentine, because it, it's, it's the number of electrical connections that are coming out of it that gives you the points of... of so out of that, how many are there coming there's out? There's only, what, three? Yeah, in this, ah. in this example, there's just three. Okay. This, is, um, this is, the reason for this complex looking shape is just to show that it's much more easy to just print these out than to okay. make them by hand. Okay. Yeah. Got so, it. I okay. Think, great. Okay. Great question. Yeah. Okay, where's the third connection? See, I said uh, one nine. for the circle, one for the. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six. I forget okay. which one switch, but there's well, two. Three. Three. One two, on each end. Yeah. 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 I got it. I got it. Thought it was like a fan or something in the background. <laughs> And so here, this is a analytical model for pose estimation. We're basically assuming, making some assumptions. So uh, what I said earlier about modeling the, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, to model these analytically, thought systems, we have to make a lot of assumptions because, for example, you go from solid mechanics, which is like more like algebra to continuum mechanics, calculus based, and so taking any sort of complex system and trying to model them with continuum mechanics gets complicated very quickly, right? If you think of finite element analysis, the runtime it takes even now for relatively small, simple materials can be on the order of like hours or days, depending on your mesh. And so what we did here was a very simplified model, just assuming that um, there's constant curvature, which you can see it's not quite, but uh, that's the assumption here. And then that a single chamber in place so that it, one chamber doesn't impact the others. And so what that allows you to do is equate the expansion and contraction forces, and that allows you to figure out the geometry at a given pressure. And I think one, um, one point about this that I like to make is that a lot of times uh, in biology, we don't calculate our where our body is in space very precisely at any given point in time, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very much an approximation. You roughly know where things are. Like I, when I reach my arm out to touch this projector, I haven't gone through like my entire forward kinematics to figure out where my body is. And yet at the same time, I know from both some sort of analytical model, roughly, and um, experience of figuring out where my body is in space, so proprioception, I can very precisely like place my hand on this projector. And so this is going back to that, that guiding question of how much is physics based and how much is learning space. What's A in this case? Your second interval, the second equation? Force a of, is yeah, a is with the, respect to uh, DA. This should be the, I think this is the cross-sectional area. So in this case. Area, got it, okay. Yeah, so in this case, it's just a circular chamber. And here's another angle on the twisting and rotating. And so what you can do is now, here we pick some points for the, the images here, so you can get like different shapes and have it twist or turn the shape to a specific location and figure out what it looks like on a 2D outline. But then if you couple that with a 3D arm, then you can actually generate a point cloud of this light bulb, for example. One thing that I've had come up before, question-wise, is the, the robot actually doesn't have any idea that it's a light bulb shape, it just knows the point in space. So there's still, uh, but you can imagine feeding this point cloud to some sort of uh, yeah, as, a, as an example. And 
so so that's kind of like another topic of research. And so to wrap up, uh, some of the applications that we are interested in are like handling, well, as I said before, it's um, the reason for soft robotics is you're able to handle variance and uh, uncertainty in the objects that you're interacting with. So that actually makes it very great for working with objects like fruit. So, so this is a company that's already starting to do some work on this. It's called Soft Robotics Inc. And they basically have a pneumatic gripper that is able to handle strawberries. And I think strawberries is a great example because, or just any fruit, because if I say like peach, for example, they come in different sizes, shapes, colors, textures, uh, stiffnesses, depending on like the temperature outside. And so all of that, um, all of that variance is very relatively challenging for a rigid robot arm to be able to handle if you just give it the command, like pick up this peach. And so food is a great um, application. And then the other area, of course, is interacting with people. So collaborative robots in like a factory environment or even service robots in the home, which I don't think is super common yet. Roomba kind of, but um, I think that's uh, on the horizon. And so what I presented, the, the main thing I presented was the, uh, the soft sensor skin and what that enables for um, pneumatic actuators and what you can do with it. So some of the applications like being able to generate a point cloud as an object. And to, to kind of close up, again, this, uh, this is another Baymax picture from the movie, but um, the, yeah, soft materials allow you to interact with fragile and fragile objects and um, uncertainty much better than you can with rigid materials. And tactile sensing is very uh, important, plays in a very important role in our lives. And so trying to, what we're doing is basically trying to look at how you combine these and give our soft robots a more informative sense of touch. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh, the game Detroit Become Human? No. What is that? It's, um, it's a game that takes place in like the year 2035 and like androids are commonplace uh, purchasable items and uh, they look just like humans except they've got this like circular LED on the side of their head and um, apparently they're all made of plastic. Um, like people always like they, they refer to them often in distaste because they're they're sore because they're like replacing a lot of their jobs and they're like what's that plastic thing doing over there you know. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> um, so it just makes me kind of think of this. It, it's like um, they seem to be a sort of a form of soft robotics, and I guess I was gonna ask for your opinion on how um, how close that is to what you're working on, and um, how how likely you think that is to work. Uh, apparently, in the game, these androids have this blue blood called Therium, and I don't know, maybe I don't know what that the purpose of it is, but um, maybe it helps drive their part their. Um, their body parts or something like that. I don't know how it works exactly. But uh, sorry, what's what's the question? <laughs> 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 uh, I, mean, I think that's very interesting. Are soft androids going to take over the world? <laughs> well, I was gonna say uh, more something like that. I guess <laughs> not. Sorry, not to. Not Are they gonna to take our jobs? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's definitely a possibility, right? I mean, something like Terminator is very much science fiction still. That is from the capabilities that people have these days, it's very far off of that. I don't think, like, I think there's a lot of fear over what AI can do at the same time. You see that in the media a lot. But again, those, there's, what, what the media portrays and like what technology can actually do, a lot of times there's a pretty well, substantial gap. So. I, I guess I was thinking of like the, the realisticness of it from a, from a technical standpoint, like, um, I guess more, my question was more like, can you think of a use for um, for a fluid circulating through a machine, kind of in the same way blood does? Mm, I see. I think one, one area that we've kind of thought about for that is as like a cooling, so like ventilation. Like uh, you see the liquid-cooled computers 
of the pendulum. And um, for something like, well, like, the other thing you mentioned is liquid act act actuators. Act actuators, thank you. Um, so, so that could be the blood, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. So, are we done? Sorry. Yeah, I guess we're just asking questions now. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm curious if you have a, a comparison between building these things um, with with a mold and then injecting the silicon versus the three D printing of the flexible material on its own. Are there specific advantages and disadvantages to each? And yeah, and then I'll, I'll have another question after that. Sure. So, short answer is yeah. There's tons of trade offs between the two options and. These are just the most common ones that we work with in our lab, but there's plenty of other uh, methods as well. So let me constrain that question. Sure. If you were just getting involved in this and you were trying to do something, which one of the two would you recommend people start with? I think silicone is probably the uh, lowest barrier of entry. If you go on So it's like molding. So you have a mold and then you inject it and, yeah, and exactly. let it burn. Got it. Um, I think, uh, I guess I'm, a lot of the videos you see on YouTube are the, like, even middle schoolers, high schoolers have uh, just, you can 3D print molds with like a MakerBot, and the, of course the quality, like the resolution and quality is not as great, but you can still use that to make some yeah. So what type of 3D printer do you use? So we, uh, the photopolymer based printer, it's, um, it's a much uh, more expensive printer. Mm -hmm. The resin is more like a, comes out like an ink rather than a plastic. And so. But it's it, still FDM? Or is it center based? It's, uh, I, I would classify it like stereolithography. Ah. Uh. Yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of like the form labs, if you guys have seen mm -hmm. that, the one that mm -hmm. pulls the. Oh, yeah. Pulls your print out of the base. It's like the carbon M one. I don't know. What's that one? Um, it's, it, it's the. Um, extruder printer that uh, supposedly had no layers in it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it extrudes like all, so, all sorts of different uh, elasticities of materials and it, it's super fast, like seven minutes for a mold. What's uh, it called? The yeah. carbon M1. Yeah. Carbon M1. So how, super how long does it take oh, yes. to <laughs> I think they only rent them instead uh, of selling them. It depends okay. on the geometry. So like awesome. something like the, the flat sensors. And I think that's actually that's not really this model either. Like less than an hour. Sure, that's but fine. If, but if I want to do like a, like that humanoid, for example, much thicker, it takes like three, four hours. Well, like for instance, one of these. Oh yeah, the one, the one over here. Right. So this printer, same thing with the Z actually is taking much longer than the XY. So if we were to print them like lying down, mm -hmm. it would only be about three or four hours as well. But standing up, they take around six. And, uh, the advantage, I guess the other advantage of 3D printing the mold is you only print it once and then you can quickly make as many of them as you want and just use one mold and yeah, that's true. crank them out. So I'm um, curious if you've ever heard of something called twisted string actuator? No, go ahead, go ahead. what is that? Uh, I'm just amazed that more people haven't have heard of this. It's, is it like the, it's uh, so simple that it's hard for people to understand. Basically you just take a motor shaft, right, on the output and you're not wrapping the string around the motor shaft like this, okay? It's, that's, that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. What's happening is you put the two ends of the string like this on the motor shaft, mm -hmm. and as the motor shaft spins, it just twists up the string, uh, okay. and then that pulls in. Yeah. And the reason why I mention it is because it has all of the same properties. It's, it, it, it is uh, uh, like air pressure, you, know, you, you can pull it out, pull it in. It's, it's applying a force, it's not mm -hmm. going to specific. You also don't need very much memory of electronics. It's a single transistor driver mm -hmm. because all you do is shut it off and then it uns unspools. Yeah. Right? Okay. So there's, well, again, there's one Japanese university that's made some amazing machines that are very fast, mm -hmm. very cheap, very easy to do. The reason why it hasn't been easy in the past is because string breaks eventually. Uh, okay. But, mm -hmm. they, well, now what they've started to do is come out with a really, really good fishing line called spider wire, yeah. which is actually a woven material, and it bends and releases billions of times before it starts to fray or break. Uh -huh. The stuff I have is 200 pound 
tabs, and I, I, I haven't really had time to play with it, but I'm kind of amazed at other people yeah, aren't. Also, I'm curious, uh, you were talking about reducing the weight and you know, all of the ancillary equipment that's behind the curtain that you have to have in order to get the actual video. There was a, a group that I, I read an article, lost track of it, somebody asked me about it, I went back and looked for it, and I could never find it again. Oh, oh that's terrible. That. <laughs> but I swear this was a university group, and what they were doing is they were, imagine a, a cylinder in a car engine, you have an explosion that pushes the piston, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they were doing that as an actuator for a robotic arm. Mm -hmm. So they had a cylinder that was placed on the arm, they injected an air gas mixture, and ignited it with a spark plug, mm -hmm. and it would move. And, and I like it. And what Pyro the, robotics. Exactly. And, and what they could do is by injecting very, very, very small amounts, they could get very, very small changes. Okay. And then they would inject more and more and more. The problem that they ran into was ventilating the, the, the space and you know, exhausting the gas after it was done. So they had to have, um, uh, you know, they were doing all kinds of stuff with valves and air pumps and like, you know, okay, it actuates to a certain point and then some other mechanism locks it and then it evacuates and then it it does it again, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So I, I just thought I'd mention it just because it was a really weird. Yeah, do you remember the name or anything? No, I don't. Okay. Completely, yeah. totally lost it. Like a diesel robot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, sort of a diesel yeah. robot. You can imagine it working really, really right. well for like yeah. a big robot that needs a lot of strength. Yeah. 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 Uh, you just have to somehow or other get the exhaust cycle to work. How do you do that? <laughs> How do you um, actually embed the force sensors? So, yeah, the fancy 3D printer uh, allows us to switch between other materials. Oh, like I see. Yeah. The whole yeah. thing is 3D printed. Okay. Yeah, exactly. This whole thing, even like the, the rigid plates and stuff are 3D printed. Right. Except for, well, this, this part is attached. To right. The and the okay. wire. So this is like actually one one single run and you're switching back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, in, in Sorry, I was just gonna ask. Uh, so, for specifically for making the uh, point clouds, uh, how uh, rigid does that uh, does the thing that you're picking up have to be in order to get a usable one? I noticed that you were picking up was it peaches, and they have a little bit of flexibility. I mean, how flexible does can something be before you can no longer get an accurate reading of a point cloud? That's a that's a good question. I don't have a specific answer to that because for the experiments that we were doing, we just we set an arbitrary threshold of like if the if the uh, sensor at the fingertip deforms a certain amount, then that counts as contact. So um, so that's kind of like the what we did was like the naive approach of if it basically presses this much so much, then it counts as a contact. If not, then it doesn't. So I think um, in terms of like how sensitive it could be, I I don't know. I don't have like a numerical answer. Did the object have to be fixed in space? Yeah, so all of those objects that you saw that it was twisting, they're all like um, mounted uh, axially. So if you push it around it a little, then you can get an accurate cloud, correct? Sorry, if, if you push the object around a little, every time you touched it, it moved a little, you'd get an inaccurate yeah, yeah, exactly. view of the world. So that's something like um, being able to just, like you know how, um, Something like, like I, I can just do like this, right? This is what I was going for originally with that. And I was like, that was, that was really tough at the time. So that's why I ended up mounting everything um, axially. But still thinking about like, how do you, because there's there's kind of, this is not just like a soft material approach of being able to like rotate this object in hand, but you also have to kind of plan the placement of each finger and like the timing and stuff. But it actually turned out that was a very complicated So, uh, what is the uh, purpose of the uh, of those uh, ribs on the uh, on those uh, actuators? What is what is the purpose of all these ribs? Uh, uh, like like the curve, curving curving back and forth. Yeah. Um, the that gives you more of a. It allows it to bend more. Right. Compared to it's kind of like an accordion. Yeah. Oh, uh, have you have you 
Got any figures on the lifetimes of the embedded sensors? Have they have they started to fail, or are they pretty much good for as long as you've been playing with them? There's some limitations. The um, I mean, I know you said it was drift, but I'm just curious at what point it completely stops working. Yeah, I guess the the material itself. We've noticed that like um, there are definitely some limitations to the 3D printed material, which is like uh, one of my lab mates. He's working on using that type of. I'm using it as a finger, but my lab mate's using it as legs. And one day he was testing at the beach. So it's nice that we can test at the beach in San Diego. <laughs> but, uh, but he noticed that all of his uh, previous measurements and programming and stuff was just off. Mm. And we realized that there's actually like oh what heat yeah it, uh, <laughs> it can stiffen the uh, and then or cold uh, stiffens it and right. softens yeah. it up a little. Right. And these affect the readings as well. Mm. And so but lifetime so far hasn't been a problem. Yeah. So. Other than the material changing a little bit itself, uh, which you can account for by just remeasuring it, so you can, you can, they're repeatable in a sense. So you need to really embed a uh, temperature sensor to be able to compensate for that. Yeah, yeah, some, something like that. I don't know, we haven't figured out how to deal with that yet. <coughs> so, so if there are problems like that with those sensors, <coughs> Uh, I mean, in the same way that you can use like a, a you can do the same kind of actuation with a cable. I know you can get it like that. Mm -hmm. If you just put a s string down straight through the thing and hook the other end of the string and wrap it around the shaft of the encoder mm -hmm. so that then when the air pressure moves that you're pulling on the string, which is rotating the encoder when it measure it. Um, it seems like that might give slightly more repeatable, uh, you know, less affected answers. But it, then again, it's also more complex and more costly. So. Not sure that's better. That's something I, I totally get where you're coming from because I I'm personally myself am not fully sold on pneumatics as the artificial muscle method. Mm -hmm. It's just that's what we've been working with here because it worked decently. But because I, I think I'm more um, I really like just looking outside and being like, oh, how does that work? And pneumatics is just not how we drive our muscles, right? Yeah, nobody it's does something that. like tendon related, like kind of like right. a string. You should definitely can twist the strings. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I think I, the, the reason I haven't um, gone into the uh, tendon or cable driven stuff yet is because, as you mentioned, there's also complications on that side as well. And, uh, so it's, yeah. So I've uh, played around with flex sensors before. How it seems like the sensors that you're embedding in there are very similar in concept to Flex sensors, mm -hmm. like you like the air for your work. Mm -hmm. Is that I have seen that it seems to wear down over time with the flux sensors, but you're saying so far you haven't noticed any degradation of them? So I guess to clarify, I what I'm saying was there there have been some changes. It's just for the purposes that we're using them for, we can recalibrate based on the changes in the material. Okay. But the material itself is So you are getting drift, you're just not getting drift off of the point of being usable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there, there is, can you tell? it's kind of happening at multiple levels. There's like the material itself is actually stiffening up. And I think that, that's got to be something with like the polymer chains inside or something. I don't know. So it's a permanent stiffening up? Yeah. yeah. Don't but use old condoms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, at the same time, there's also when just when you're using them, there's some drift in the in any of these soft polymer materials, and that's I think because there's kind of um, multiple layers of abstraction at which the um, soft material is deforming, and so these like short period of time changes, we can actually we've been using. Uh, recurrent neural networks, which allow you to account, learn patterns over time. And so that's, we can address some of the short-term changes through that. Okay. And then, um, but then for like the actual material uh, changing over long periods of time, that's just like you either recalibrate or use a new, make a new one. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Cool. Thanks.
Thanks. If you can give yeah, a round of applause to Ben. So do you guys have a uh, like a website at UCSD that we can? Yeah, yeah.